told you. I told you. Fuck it. Give it up for Kelsey, everybody. <laughs> I've been told to try and not cuss or vape, so we'll see what happens. Uh, all right, I got this Kit Kat. Um, hi, hello, good morning. Welcome to Creative Mornings. I am poet Jen Harris, and I am incredibly grateful that you got up this early because I'm self-employed and I wouldn't be here. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored. Eric, thank you very much for your time and dedication to this organization as well. I am I'm so honored. Um, so that video uh, actually just released this week, so I was like, ha ah, I'm in a documentary. I'm going to show you guys. And then I warned them that I have an energy that scrambles all electronics. It's <laughs> happened my entire life. I have... You can ask my ex-wife, I have ruined microwaves, I have exploded dryers and washers, I shut down car batteries, and every time I have a major event in any place in the United States where I'm like, this is it, Oprah's gonna see this, this is it, flatline, their Wi-Fi fails, their cameras, somebody gets in a car accident, it's just, so I am 100% not surprised that that didn't work. Um, Basically, what that gave you was the, was the introduction I didn't want to write um, to my life, which is um, to say that my turning point in my lost experience was a moment in my life when I was 27. I'm now 34. But I was 27, and I was like, wow, I am just in a relationship to be in a relationship. And I am in a big city because I don't want to be a girl from the Midwest who stayed in the Midwest. And uh, I hate everything about my life. Uh, what am I doing? So um, we'll backtrack a little bit. But that's, that's the summary of that video. They just did it better than I do it. So, um, so here, let's see if I can do this correctly. Yeah. All right. So I only have a few slides because I did this at 5 p.m. last night when Kelsey needed it at 5.30. So uh, <laughs> self-employment. <laughs> Uh, I also take on too many things all the time because I feel that I, I have the, the spirit of a 20-year-old and the minded body of a mid-30s person, so, and I have not accepted that. And for all of you in your 20s, that means you can lift everything and you can walk everywhere and you can stay awake for days. And then you suddenly are in your mid-30s and you're like, I need a nap. <laughs> it is 11 a.m. and I need a nap. <laughs> so, um, th in this photo, I am 16 years old. I am convinced of my immortality. I have lived in two countries, at least three states, gone to at least six schools, and um, depending on who you asked, I either demanded to be released from the custody of my parents or I was kicked out for being gay. Um, it's pretty much a combination of both. Um, I have always been a creative spirit, and I have never had time to listen to anybody tell me how to do anything. So it's a very difficult child to raise. Um, <laughs> I, I blended in, which was a chameleon experience that you learn when you are a child of a military brat. You move all over the country, you move all the time, you move on a dime, you leave at midnight, whatever it is, and you kind of, you learn to blend in in a new place, you learn to exert extroverted behaviors, but I never fit in anywhere. And I can say I never fit in because I grew up in the 90s and there were no visibly queer people anywhere that I lived in rural America. Nowhere. Nobody was gay. And uh, I mean, I was with my first girlfriend for an entire year before I ever heard the word lesbian. And uh, it dawned on me that I was a homosexual. Everybody was upset about at church. So I just had no idea. It's fine. You can laugh. I, have, I make a living on my pain. So don't stress. <laughs> I know, right? Absolutely. It's what I do. Um, and I, I, can, I could reframe that to say that uh, telling my truth set me free. And so in that, I have, I have decided to sit at home and write about my feelings a lot. Um, let's look at my notes here. So this girl has zero direction, uh, except for furiously crafting around Hobby Lobby craft sets and uh, protesting conformity. I was very much the girl under the bleachers, like chain smoking, like sports are dumb. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't know who I was or where I wanted to be or what I was up to. Um, I worked really, really hard at my many part-time jobs to afford my class ring. I don't know why that was important to me, but it was. And I put poet where you would normally put your last name, right? And on the inside, I engraved rock star. It was a little secret to myself. 
And then I graduated high school and forgot I liked to write for about a decade. I just, I went out into the world um, and I tried to do what my mother suggested, which was get a job and a husband. Uh, I get fired from all of my jobs and not once have I looked at a man and been like, that's the one for me. <laughs> so it's very confusing, very challenging decade. I, uh, I was just like, I keep trying to date dudes, but I keep winding up with ladies. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> So I, I went out into the world, and from the ages of 16 to 26, um, I moved more than 20 times in the general metro area. I am completely incapable of holding still. I move in someplace, I set everything up, I hang all my art on the walls, and then I'm like, nope, fuck this, we gotta go. I don't, I'm just so uncomfortable. I could never, I could never find a place. And I still struggle with that but I understand so much more now that I was unable to find a place because my place that I was seeking was internal, right? We're all looking for definition. We're all looking for clarity and sense of self. And I, I just, I didn't know that's what we were supposed to be looking for. I thought I was supposed to be excited about a mortgage or a marriage or an education, uh, something else I'm really good at doing in the lost and wandering around is it took me seven years to graduate with a bachelor's degree. Uh, I know, right? Yeah. Got it though, got it, got it, got it. Uh, first person in my family to go to college, third person to graduate. Uh, it's true, it's true. I, it's absolutely true. My, uh, my father went uh, to college in his 40s um, and I was, I was taking online classes because I was like, I'm still in school but I don't really want to be there, you know? Uh, theme in my life, obviously. Um, but my father went and got his bachelor's degree in his 40s for a promotion, and I was like, man, I should, I should probably finish that, you know? <laughs> they keep calling about my student loans, and I'm not paying them back if I don't have anything to show for it. So now I have that $60,000 piece of paper, and I'm still not paying them back. So <laughs> don't tell them. Um, so between the ages of 16 and 26, I, I struggled a lot. I experienced a tremendous amount of trauma. I had no representation, no visibility, no understanding of myself. I had no labels, I had no clarity, I had no sense of purpose. I struggled constantly. I lived in cars, I lived in motels, I lived in flea-infested basements. I, I didn't know where I belonged to any degree. I had uh, I was in a relationship with somebody who, at this point in my career, in my experience, in my understanding of myself and my trauma, was very much a survival relationship. This person was more than twice my age, and they just kind of took care of me. And I took care of them because I didn't know how to take care of myself. I had no concept of that uh, before I had embarked out on my own journey. I had very much been a caretaker of my younger siblings, and my family was a very... I don't know how many of you come from this environment, but when you come from very small towns and very nomadic people, you have a tendency to really like hunker down in your understanding of family and it's just us against the world, even if we are a toxic unit in and of ourselves. Um, so I had no concept of self-care. I understood from my church, from my community, that your output is what matters. It's never what you take in and how you care for yourself. Um, and then, while pursuing my seven years in undergrad, um, I fell in love with somebody that, uh, she's now my ex-wife, but she's still one of my best friends, and she broke my heart for the first of three times, and I was like, fuck this, I'm out. And I got in my car and I drove to San Francisco because I was gonna win this fight. Uh, I was gonna prove to her that I didn't need her, and if I couldn't be with her, I wasn't gonna be here. And so I went to California, and, uh, I recently discovered, thanks to a Apple playlist, Apple Music playlist called What Would Dolly Do? Uh, <laughs> I was listening to all of the old country songs that my parents used to play, because it was country and gospel, that's what I was allowed to be involved in. And I realized how many of the women I listened to that talked about California, like somewhere in the undercurrent of all those songs, they were like, get away, get out of here, escape. And so I blame Trisha Yearwood and Dolly Parton and the Dixie Chicks and everybody else for putting that in my mind. Um, but somewhere in the back of my mind, I thought, if I go to California, 
something about me will be more visible. It'll be more clear. It will change. And at this point, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, I had gone to college for a little while. I went to Johnson County Community College and I had walked into my first journalism class and my first mentor that I'd ever had in my entire life, he looked at me and said, you're gonna be the next editor-in-chief of the Campus Ledger. And I was like, uh, I'm sorry, what? I don't know what you're talking about. And mind you, I weighed about 100 pounds more than I do now because I had a lot of trauma weight. I had a completely shaved head. It was a very, very uh, obvious lesbian, as I like to refer to it. Uh, I just, I, I was a mess. And I walked into this college class, and he pointed at me, and he said that. And I was like, all right, man, whatever. Um, that changed my life. That was the first time my life was changed, because I suddenly, somebody else gave me permission to explore the potential of a purpose. And within a year, I was the editor-in-chief of the Campus Ledger. And within a year of that, I won 73 national awards for all of the journalism work that I had done. And I had a sense of purpose and a sense of self for the first time ever. So I believed that writing was important. I could make a living while writing. And also, I didn't want to be in the Midwest anymore because my heart was broken and I was tired of defining myself by very small standards. That's how I felt. I felt like I needed to be a big fish in a bigger pond which is very arrogant and youthful. Uh, I'm gonna go to California where they appreciate me. Uh, so, so JUCO happened. I started working at a bookstore um, and this man used to come in and he would buy all of the books from the business section that I stocked. And I was like, what are you doing? You buy all these books, it really irritates me. It makes the three books you leave fall over. Uh, what are you doing? And he was like, oh, I buy these at a discount rate from you guys. And then I clean them up and I sell them on Amazon for their actual retail value. And I was like, all right, seems reasonable. <laughs> I mean, I get it. Buy low, sell high, let's do this. Um, so when I uh, had my heart broken, like I said, and I was like, fuck it, I'm out of here. I'm going to California. I went out to California in October of, I think, 2014. And I went to visit this guy's warehouse where he was cleaning up books and sending them to Amazon. And when you buy used books on Amazon through Prime, that's exactly what, what people are doing. They're cleaning them up. They buy them at Goodwill for a nickel. They send them to Amazon with a label on them. And then you pay $4 million for them. <laughs> and uh, that's what he was doing. And lucky for me, he wasn't a murderer. He didn't assault me in any way. He was a nice person. And he's like, do you want to come out to California and run this warehouse for me? And I was like, yes, I do. Also, this lady ripped my heart in half. I got to go. Uh, so I, uh, I got rid of everything except what would fit in my cute little hatchback. And I took off for California. And it was the most beautiful five days of my entire life. <laughs> I drove across this country. And I was like, I'm free. I'm never coming back. Obviously, that didn't work out. Um, but I did. I went out there for a year. And I went out there for a year. And I quickly, quickly discovered that this job was remarkably overwhelming. Um, I was working with, um, this guy wasn't there very often. The person who was technically in charge uh, was suffering from pretty extreme depression and wasn't coming into work. And there were a few employees, myself included. So that just kind of left me to do what I have always done, which is pick up the mess. So I started running the business. I started being in charge of the business. I started making sure that we got everything done. And um, within a few months, the, the person in charge left. And I was suddenly actually in charge, getting paid to be in charge of the business. And I have a huge uh, problem with perfectionism. I'm working on it with my therapist, don't worry. Uh, but I, I couldn't keep up with the demands of the business because we were, we were receiving hundreds if not thousands of books a month, having them delivered and you go through each one of them individually and you scan them with a hand scanner and there are all these stats and whether they'll sell, sell on Amazon or they go to recycling, uh, that's my job to figure out, clean them up, box them off, send them away. Kind of boring, but the reality is, is it was a 16 hour day, five days a week and I didn't want to let him down. I didn't want to come back to Kansas City and be like, I've failed. 
at the one thing I have really escaped and tried to do. I want to live in San Francisco. I want to be a writer in San Francisco one day, and this is my gateway to staying here. So instead of uh, just learning how to work a regular business day and accept the limits of my human experience, I got a cocaine addiction because then you can stay awake. It's fine. Uh, I love cocaine. I'm, just, you know, I'm sad it's not in my life anymore, uh, but it was going to kill me, so I had to stop doing it. <laughs> the reality is, is that I started using uppers in any form that I could get them to keep myself awake and functioning as a human being. I wanted to work all the time. I wanted to make everybody proud. I wanted to pay my bills. I wanted to send my mother money. I wanted to prove that we weren't going to be stuck here as a family, generationally. I had nieces at that point, and I wanted to be the aunt that got away, the one that went out and did something big. And for some reason, that felt like the only chance I was ever going to have. So I, I got real, real into my drugs. But I'm such a high-functioning addict, nobody knew, really, that I was, I was as strung out as I was. And that's where that intro video comes in, because it says, you know, I was 27, I was unhappy, I was dating somebody I didn't like, I was strung out, I was wildly successful at the job I was doing, I, and I, I just, I was there in my life at this moment, and I didn't know what I was looking forward to, but I sure wasn't enjoying what I was doing anymore. So, um, I went one day with a person I was dating to the Berkeley Poetry Slam. Is anybody here familiar with Poetry Slams? Yeah, I've got some snappers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh. So I went to the Berkeley Poetry Slam, shaken and strung out, very skinny. It was the skinniest I've ever been. That's the other problem about drugs. When you have a body image issues, when you get real skinny, people are like, you are looking good. And I'm like, you're right, I should keep doing these drugs. <laughs> Bad call, never think that. It's not cohesive or healthy. Um, but I went to Berkeley Poetry Slam, and I'd never seen anything like it. Poetry Slams are competitive poetry events. So the format is you have three minutes and 10 seconds on stage to tell your story. You are judged by five random people in the audience with whiteboards who score you from one to 10. One, don't ever come back. Nobody wants to hear you speak. 10 is a religious conversion. You have changed everybody's minds, and you are a miracle. Thank you for being here. That being said, the first person who went up on stage was the MC, and he said, this is a church for people who don't have one. And that ripped me open, because I missed my church, but I wasn't allowed in my church because I'm gay. And I missed my community. I missed the people that held me close and kept me safe, because that's what rural America truly does provide, when it's, when it's healthy and beautiful, right? So I was like, well, I live here now. <laughs> the next woman who went up said, it's been five years and I'm still coaching my ghosts. And I thought, I know exactly what she means. Me too, right? Me too, I know exactly what you mean. And I was like, I'm gonna do that. And so, I decided to do that. I decided to start telling my truths. And the first time I went on stage, I forgot that there was a three minute, 10 second time limit. <laughs> and at five minutes I hear, dun, 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 and they literally took me off of the stage, <laughs> removed me, time's up, you've disqualified yourself, and also that poem sucked, come back again later. Um, but I kept going back, and I, sometimes I would participate, sometimes I would chicken out. Um, as the years would go on, I would have to take two shots of whiskey before I went on stage, and then I would take one shot of whiskey before I went on stage, and then I decided to learn how to do it sober or give it up because it seemed unreasonable to have to get a little jacked up before you do what you love. So I went and I participated in the Berkeley Poetry Slam. I got sober, <clears throat> and in a brave moment, I reached out to the person who broke my heart. She reached back out to me. We reconnected. And I came back to Kansas City, got rid of all my shit, drove my hatchback back, and for four years we were the happiest we had ever been. That, during that time, during that time, I became this person. Nope. <laughs> Kelsey, what happened? I'm sorry. That person, that person. Look at that couture outfit. <laughs> 
I came back here and I didn't really have any concept of how a poetry slam ran internally. I just had like a general idea of the outline. And I was like, I went to um, the former Uptown Arts Bar on an open mic night because I was back in Kansas City and I had been going to poetry regularly and I needed poetry. I needed to be there. I needed to be at an open mic. I needed to share my story. I needed to connect with people. It was keeping me sober. It was keeping me sane. Well, that open mic was canceled because nobody came to it. <laughs> and uh, I, I met the host outside and I was like, this is not acceptable. I am lonely and queer and back in the Midwest and I need somebody to talk to about my feelings. <laughs> and I don't have health insurance. So uh, where is everybody? <clears throat> and they were like, oh, it gets canceled all the time. And I was like, okay. Well, I guess I have to start a poetry slam then. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I found out that Poetry Slam Incorporated was a nationally existing organization that required you submit certain amount of evidence over the course of six months to prove that you had a legitimate Poetry Slam. So I printed out their booklet and highlighted everything and I was like, we're going to do this. And we did. And it's five years old now and it's sold out every month. Right? Right? And I made, I made my first chat books by hand. I don't know if you've ever saddle stitched a book together 40, 50, 60 times, but that's awful. Uh, sold those for $10, should have sold them for 100, you know what I mean? But I came back and I founded Kansas City Poetry Slam and that is truly another turning point in which my entire life changed. I thought I was gonna be in California, I thought I was gonna discover myself there, and to a degree I did. I learned what I'm made of, and I learned what I can't take anymore. I learned who I am. I learned that it's not Kansas City. It's not Kansas City's fault that my life was the way it was. It's not, California's not gonna fix it. I also learned that poetry can heal everybody who participates in it, whether you're in the audience or you're on the stage. It can change your life. It can make everything better. It can connect you. It can, it can break you open and make you fall apart. It's not this archaic, terrible art form that you experience in ninth grade English where you're like, why are we here today? Because I also hated that class. It gave me a purpose. And now I make a living full time writing and performing poetry. I write with corporations. I do public and private workshops, including the writing workshop KC, which happens every Tuesday. I I've worked for, I've done concerts, I've done TED Talks, I was on Queer Eye, take yeah. that, right? <laughs> They're like, you wanna be on this show? And I was like, what show? I don't watch TV. Yeah, I'm coming, uh, on my way. <laughs> Sounds popular, I'll be right there. <laughs> I didn't know, I mean I, I mean, I knew about Queer Eye, but I don't have time to watch TV, unless it's terrible adult cartoons at you know, two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, you know, you understand. <laughs> this guy gets it. Um, all of that to say, I want you to leave today with a little bit of my story, a little bit of your own story seen in my story. I want you to understand that it is important to accept at the core of your human experience that there is no lost and found. You are in the present moment. Everything that you are dealing with, you are stepping over, you are overcoming is paving the path to wherever it is you're supposed to be. You're not doing it wrong. It is just this hard. It truly is. It's incredibly important to accept yourself in the present. You're not screwing up your life by being unsure. You're not failing because you don't know where you wanna be or where you wanna go. You're just, you're doing just fine. You know, I, I thought there was a huge difference between this person and the person before, and there's not at all. She just didn't know where she wanted to wind up, so she wandered around a lot. And I have, I have lived many, many, many lives. I could tell you every year that I was a different person. I have worn a different hat, I've worn a different uniform, I have served you Taco Bell, and I have told you that you are not coming in for this interview because I don't like your attitude or your resume. Like, I, I've done it all. And it all made me who I am. It gave me a sense of purpose. It gives me the strength and the resiliency to keep going. 
And that is truly all I want to do in this world for other people, is remind them that you can make it, that it's going to be okay. There's, there's, there's nothing better on the other side of anything. You are still who you are. You still carry your pain, you still carry your past, you still struggle, you still doubt, you still fear, you're still broke. Sometimes you're richer than God, and other days I'm like, I'm gonna call my brother and see if he'll get me some groceries. <laughs> you know, there's no, there's no right way to do this. There's, no, there's not a number of times you can go back to somebody that you love before it's too many times, before it's absurd. You make that decision, you make that call. You decide what's important to you, what's priority and what's not, who you are, what matters. Nobody else gets to do that. And I think it's just incredibly important that everybody knows that. That you, you don't have to make any choices that make anybody else happy. Your responsibility is to take care of yourself. Your responsibility is to bring light and joy to the lives of others. And you can do that by being who you are. So there are two poems that I want to perform for you. And the first one is the Turning Point poem. It's the one you got the printout of, of Shower Curtain. And this poem is a turning point because when I was hosting my very first Poetry Slam team, a group of five very bitchy individuals who had no respect for me, I asked them to write something happy, to come to the stage with something positive. And the most I can say about that is that somebody came to the stage with a poem about when the zombie apocalypse occurs, how she can't wait to kill everybody. <laughs> and all the stuff she was gonna tear up, all the buildings she was gonna burn down. It was very clever, but it wasn't happy, wasn't uplifting, it was sarcastic. But I challenged myself with that because Poetry Slam, at its core, is a place for you to exhale what hurts, for you to connect with other people in the audience, but it is also a place for you to heal and grow and uplift. So this poem, Shower Curtain, was meant to just make you smile. You're welcome to laugh. You're welcome to giggle. You can stare me dead in the face and not make any expression at all. I'm still going to do it. <laughs> if you like it, this is a good response. If you've got the fingers to snap, you can snap, you can clap, you can stomp your feet. But again, if you don't like it, nobody wants to hear from you, so wrap it up. <laughs> My shower curtain has known me longer than any of my lovers. It's kept my tears in the tub and blocked out the sun of unwelcome dawns. It's musty with the history of my mildewing melodramas. The watercolor ink splatters taking the shape of blue fish and red petunias. It is my cloak behind which I have played both coy and coward, been embraced and rejected. I've held on to it for dear life, backhanded, battered it when it clung too tightly, slammed shut and ripped open its shrill metal accordion melody, the soundtrack of both my beginnings and endings. Oh, shower curtain. You were once the newest thing I owned, the most adult and the most expensive. <laughs> $24.99 at Ikea. When I took you home that first night with matching towels and bath mat, I unwrapped you with the delicacy of a tissue paper Tiffany's box. You meant something. You meant I finally had a home safe enough to make monthly decisions in. You comforted my flu and my whiskey stomach with your maternal familiarity. You were the only vinyl I could afford. <laughs> you meant art and privacy, sanctuary and stability. You meant I am my mother's daughter the kind of woman who decorates, <laughs> even the bathroom. Oh, shower curtain, you know all of my truths. You know me Midwest meltdown and California cocaine and sometimes you're the only one who knows I cried that day. You see the clockwork of vitamins, the inconsistency of flossing, the toenails, the toothbrush, the earring behind the toilet. You are a watercolor mural of nonsensical dribbles to the next contour and I just realized tonight brushing you off of my static -y arm, that you have never scoffed at my weight. Contrary, you try to hug my body in its most vulnerable form. You have protected me from fights, the way you harmonize the shrieking shower head with the temperature nozzles to make my ex-wife's arguments inaudible is pure fucking magic. 
You are among my favorite things, especially when you dance on a mowed lawn breeze while I wash the green down the sink. Oh, shower curtain. You really know how to make a girl feel at home. Thank you. I'm gonna do this other one right quick. Can you go back to your video? Oh, Kelsey's got this Kit Kat situation handled. <clears throat> Is that my video? Whenever you're ready. All right, hang on. Here, do I have to hit something? Hit the arrow. Down arrow. Down arrow. All right, give it up for Kelsey one more time, folks. So the most therapeutic thing I think I've ever done for myself um, came in a very tragic moment, as I think some of us have that experience also. You suddenly change and pivot when something terrible happens. Um, when I was about 26, maybe 27, my friend Clint died, and he drank himself to death. And his funeral, which I did not attend because I was already in California, I am told was a very um, proselytizing biblical experience and he was a very atheistic gay theater kid. And I think sometimes in the queer experience in particular, when you have a disconnect from your family but they still love you and then they lose you, they do the best that they can. I was much angrier about this when I was younger, that I didn't feel that he was represented in his truest self, but that doesn't mean they didn't try. But on that note, I decided to write my own eulogy because I thought, if this ever happens to me, which statistically it happens to many queer people, you know, we die young and we die of self-abuse if the world doesn't kill us first. And I didn't want anybody to say anything about me that I didn't already say my damn self. So. That's this video. When they ask you about my life, I want you to tell them that I made something out of nothing. I was born between a Bible and a rifle, blue collar Americana, strict as hospital corners, heavy as King James scripture, turned words into wings to find others like me. I rode the train coast to coast solely for the sake of poetry. Drank sake from cough syrup cups, snorted cocaine off of pen caps, slept in turquoise jewels and wore yushankas in the summertime. I held swings hostage and chain smoked in bunk beds. I wrote poems to never would be lovers through marriages out with the pizza boxes. I recycled old flames. I broke my only loaf of bread with geniuses went broke on payday, every moment was a gamble, and I was spectacular in my glory. I made ends meet at pawn shops, gave birth to great ideas on sticky tabletops, aborted well-paying jobs for the coal mines of creation. I slept on stolen time, backpack, knapsack, my treasure chest pillow, creaking back, crackling echo across the rise of dawn, smoking slow while tears roll down my cheeks, weeping at the new day choir of color, exposing me as I age to loss. I miss every soul who ever lost their youth to the idea that maybe tomorrow will be just the same as today, and today, today was a hard day. I never got any rest. I shared bar stools with missionaries, raised a toast to mortality, and was taught to dance by men in six inch heels. I dove into midnight, resurfaced days later, adopted too many strays, shrieked unforgivable blasphemies at pedestrians. I nearly lost my life on a corporate detour, but they could never take my soul. I'm royalty who made my castles in shotgun studio apartments and dive bars, broke the spine of every fresh book to strike fear into the fair weather poets. Do not linger here unless you desire to make a home among hot coals. I twisted my tongue into adjectives, lathering every syllable with syntax. I apologized for vulnerability, for being born, being gone, being distant, being out, but I have never apologized for the art. 
I bound my breasts on Monday morning, freed my femininity on Friday night, scraped together sentimental scraps to make presents on holidays. I rode bicycles and filed bankruptcy twice, ate chocolate in bed, fell in love in karaoke bars, made love in front of other people, grew homesick for cities I have never visited but always dreamed of, dove palms first into both coast oceans in a week's time twice. I looked up from a microphone to see 3,000 eyes, feared today as much as tomorrow, fought epic, merciless battles with partners whose names are tattooed down my arms, I immortalized their effect in ink. Permanent. My hesitation is as negotiable as my hair color, but I could not afford to risk forgetting that at least once in my lifetime, I had known profound and unconditional love. I took everything for granted. I doctored rejection letters with community gatherings, failure with forever trying again, addressed uncertainty with astrology. I sacrificed lunch hours for stanzas, exhausted my introvert with extrovert activities in hopes of finding relevance through publication. I blew my gas money on magic rocks and fine point pens, shared toothbrushes, suicidal thoughts, funeral pews, Christmas Eve, celebrated half birthdays, loathed matrimony, rituals, and obligation unless it came as a command in my dreams and then in gratitude to the muse I obeyed unconditionally. When they ask you about my life, I want you to tell them that I'd answered to an intuition that felt like a memory, a sense of urgency to make everything beautiful with the way of my words. I never intended to do any good. It was all a byproduct of chasing the whisper of a calling, falling in, fatuation with telling the truth gave others permission to tell theirs too. I wore all the colors and I lived in all the worlds, and there were none I liked better than the ones where I was loved. Love was the best part about my life. There was nothing better, and really, nothing else worth mentioning. So when they ask you about my life, I want you to tell them that it was worth every minute. Thank you all so much.